What Happens in the Woods behandlar autentiska kriminalfall. Vi diskuterar ofta händelser av våldsam natur. Känsliga lyssnare varnas. What Happens in the Woods is a true crime podcast. We discuss events that are often violent in nature. Listeners discretion is advised. Personal security has come a long way in the past few years. We live in a world of constant surveillance. Businesses, intersections, streets, all have ways to trace our movements. We have social media that records evidence of where we've been and what we've done. We have security cameras that record the events that happen around our homes. Not much of a person's life can remain a mystery with all of these technological advances. Some may say these things are an intrusion on law-abiding citizens' lives. Some may argue, if you have nothing to hide, there shouldn't be an issue. When a murder occurs in a rural part of Washington, no one is very hopeful that the murderer will be found. However, no one, not even the murderer, counted on one little piece of recording equipment to be their downfall. Or in this case, multiple simple recording devices that trail one man in the early morning of October 24, 2017, and help link him one video at a time to the crime that ended the life of a great community leader. Join us as we discuss a case that is a great example of what happens when the wrong people underestimate the advances in technology that make it harder for criminals to succeed. This is True Crime Podcast, What Happens in the Woods, with your host, Justin Bryce. Let's get started. And welcome. Hi, Bryce. Hello. Hello. As you're trying to get water in your mouth. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Put you on the spot. All right. This has been a crazy, kind of busy week. We've got a lot going on. We've got two birthdays this week. We've got Father's Day. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be so excited. No. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. I guess she can tell Bryce is super excited and enthused for Father's Day. Yay. Yeah. Uh it's also Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. And it's almost the summer solstice, which is gonna mean it's gonna be super sunny here. Yeah. Yeah. And Mercury is in retrograde again. Fucking Mercury. Whatever. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. The fucking crazies come out of the woodwork and they're like everywhere. Oh, they're always there. No, yeah, they're there, but they, they're not as as evident. Yes, they are. No. No. All right. Uh, do you have any updates? Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, yes. That's that, right. That actually ties in with what we're talking about today. Oh. You didn't even know. I wanted to say happy Juneteenth. Okay. And also Sweden. Sweden's back in the lead as of recording. Yeah. Yeah, which leads me to my update. What's that? I got my DNA, my oh. ancestry <laughs> oh, that's right. DNA results. <laughs> uh, the world has ended as you know it. Turns out I'm not who I thought I was <laughs> at all. Yeah, I, yeah, I've been lied to. We're I don't even know who you are anymore. I don't know who I am either. 
We're mortal enemies now. No. We should be. Yeah. Yes. Sure. <laughs> so it turns out I am 48% Scottish, which I didn't know that that, that was part of my heritage. And then... Well, and the, these are ranges. Let's just say that because all of this added up together, does it equals more than 100%, which is not physically possible. So 48% Scottish, 45% uh, British Isles and Northern European, which includes Sweden, which I had no idea. Yeah. And Belgium and France. And then 11% Wales, which... No idea. There's no Irish. I thought this whole time that I was Irish. <laughs> I'm not Irish. You're I, not Irish. I mean, maybe it's somewhere, but I didn't get the genetics. You're or Scottish. I'm Scottish. I did know that. Yeah. But yeah, because my, my maiden name is Scottish. Yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, that, that changes a lot of things for me. <laughs> there were some things that I thought that are no longer valid. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, everybody go, uh, if you're interested, it was easy to do. It did take a few weeks, but you know, the results are there. It's pretty cool. You might connect with somebody that you didn't know you were related to. You never know. Or it gives you a reason to disavow your family. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it could open a whole can of worms that you That's know, right. you have no idea what you're doing. I mean, it's yeah. possible. Yeah. So Yeah. Different, that's a little different than what I thought it was going to be, but that's all right. I guess I'm going to embrace my new heritage. You don't have a choice. <laughs> I, I, I could, I could deny, I could yeah. act like I never knew. Right. I could have been like, there was a mistake. The yeah. lab mixed some shit up and that's right. yeah, I could have, I could have. I spit into the wrong tube. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or they gave me the wrong results. Right. Yeah. But I I won't do that. I will. No, doesn't it connect to your family? Um. It, yeah. If anybody's on Ancestry.com, you can then connect, which I have not paid for that. Oh. Yeah. At one time, I had signed up for it a long time ago when it first started. I had signed up for it. And it was super expensive. Yeah. So I I just kind of was like, yeah, that's... I'm not going to do that, but I may kind of go into that and see if I can, what it, what it is now, like how much it is now or what you can get for free or, you know what I mean? Cause there's some yeah. things that you can look at for free. So yeah, I, it has like emailed me a couple of like suggestions so far, but it also like in that profile, it gave you where your like the people coming from those countries where they entered the U S and yeah. settled. So I have more of an idea of where some of that family was from, from, and it's not where I thought it was either, which is weird. So I had always thought that like my dad's family had come in from Canada, yeah, but that was not what was listed. So yeah, just some, some things that contradict some information that I have. So now I'm, I don't know. I don't know what to believe anymore. I don't even know who you are. I don't know. I was sold a false bill of goods. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. I I gave you the information that I had. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that I'm no longer Irish. You fucking snob. That's right. <laughs> Whatever. I'm Scottish. It's better. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You say so. I do. Okay. Okay. All right. Are you ready to get into this episode? Let's do it. Okay. All right. So this case is one that I found pretty much, well, exactly by accident. I was actually looking at another case where a guy murdered his wife. And this was just a link on the side. And I was kind of curious. Yeah. And then I went down the rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, I knew, I, I knew exactly that we were going to do this for this, like right before Juneteenth. Cause like I said, it, it kind of plays into that. So I, I knew this episode was going to be, once I found it, we had to do it. Okay. All right. So here we are. So I'm going to take you through everything, uh, chronologically, kind of how it plays out for like the detectives, the investigators. Yeah. 
Um, and that starts with a frantic 911 call in the early morning of October 24th, 2017. So this is very recent. Oh. This is a 911 call placed by a woman who's reporting what she thought was a body in the road outside of a friend's house that she was visiting. Yeah. So it's about 3.30 a.m. when the woman was leaving her friend's home. She noticed something unusual in the middle of the road. Hadn't been there before, like when she was driving to her friend's house. Mm -hmm. So she goes back to get her friend. Um, He comes back with her to see like what this is. Because she's thinking at first it might be like a tree that had fallen down. Yeah. Which didn't make sense. It wasn't like storming. It wasn't windy. And like I said, just a couple hours before it wasn't there. Yeah. But she uh, gets her friend. They come back and they are trying to figure out what's going on. She flashes her high beams and they see an arm. So they. This isn't like a highway, is it? It's not like a. Okay. Mm -mm. So. She calls 911. She tells the dispatcher that she thinks there's a body that maybe somebody's run over it, but it doesn't look alive. This woman, you can hear the 911 call. Um, She is so stunned that she just can't like she can't gather her thoughts. She can't even tell the dispatcher like where she is. It takes her like a few seconds to even remember like where the hell she is. So. Eventually, she gives this location. It's a rural uh, road in Pierce County outside of Lake Taps. Mm -hmm. So Pierce County Sheriff make it to the location off of Forest Canyon Road. They find a pretty horrific scene. They find a deceased woman who looks to have been stabbed, left in the road, and then set on fire. Okay. Yeah. Uh, The fire has caused some damage, but it, it wasn't enough to have actually been the cause of death. Yeah. Um, essentially what it did would was clo- uh, burn her clothes. Okay. They think that accelerant was, was used, um, but it wasn't enough to keep the fire lit to actually burn the body. Yeah. So she's fully clothed, but like I said, the fabric has been burned around the body. Investigators believe the fire is, is to conceal the identity because yeah. there's fabric like over her face that was burned. There's no ID. There's nothing on the body that gives them any idea of who she may be or how she came to be out there. Mm -hmm. The victim appears to be African-American, but they cannot be sure of her age. Um, The crime scene is actually pretty clean. The only thing that they do find um, that they think that's linked to the actual crime scene is a cheap, like, clear lighter. The ones that they, like, give you for free if you buy a carton of cigarettes Uh and shit like that. So the sheriff started contacting other law enforcement agencies within the area, you know, to kind of be on the lookout for like missing persons to try to help identify this person, um, possibilities of kidnappings, anything that might have occurred within the last couple of days to just try to help identify her. They start going through the neighborhood, of course. They're questioning the residents along this road. And mind you, it's like it's. Out in the boondocks, there's just a few houses. It's pretty, there's like no street lights, pretty much. Like the lights are coming from homes. Mm -hmm. So they're questioning people. Um, They don't get any more witnesses. So they have the the eyewitness, of course, that found the body. But they do catch a break when it's noticed that a house on the corner by where the body was found has a security camera that faces the intersection. Oh, shit. Right. Right. Unfortunately, this video is is not the best. Um, the view is blocked by a carport, so it's kind of set back on the back side of the house. Mm-hmm. The carport's on the side of the house, and then from there you would see the intersection. They do notice, though, that you can see two vehicles. So when they're actually looking at this video, they, you know, given the timeline based off of the woman who called 911 and when she went down the street of course there was nothing there yeah that was uh at 1 27 a.m so then she's leaving a couple hours later by about 3 30 then there's the body so they have a pretty tight timeline yeah one is a dark pickup truck so one of these vehicles the other is a dark sedan the truck shows up first So it's driving down the main road, and then seconds later, the sedan comes from the same direction, makes a right turn onto the road where the victim was found. Mm -hmm. Not long after that, the truck uh, had made a U-turn, came back around, and stops on the main road 
but along where the sedan is parked. Okay. So they're at the intersection. Officers are kind of thinking this is leading them to believe that there are maybe two or more people responsible for this crime. Um, because of the blocked view, they never get a look at anyone in the car or the truck and they cannot place, you know, there's, there's no way to zoom in enough to look at the license plates. Yeah. So the first is the, f- uh, first to drive off is the truck. It, it was like barely there for a minute. The sedan stays in the road for about 10 minutes after that makes a U-turn, um, goes back out to the main road And when the sheriffs are watching this footage, they notice that after making the U-turn on the side of the car, there are some bright lights that are not like explainable that's reflecting off of the car. Mm -hmm. It would look like if somebody, you know, if there was another car shining lights at that car, which there was not. Um, This is the only car out there at this time. So, the camera, it's its just a basic like infrared uh, home security camera. Like I mentioned, it's not the best quality, but what they see, they realize is the fire that was started. Oh. Yeah. So they know exactly what time that was set then because of the camera footage. So you can't see much, like I said, because of the quality, but you know, when you're watching that video, it's, it's kind of horrific to realize that you're watching what you're watching, yeah. you know? So while this footage shows, um, you know, timeline, basically mm-hmm. investigators, not any closer to identifying number one, the victim or number two, any, either one of the vehicles, but getting video footage is still, you know, it's, it's, it's enough that they, they've got a good start. Yeah. It takes a little while, but detectives are able to also get footage from a boating business. That's not far away. So when they review that, it shows the truck coming from an intersection and making a right turn. And then just a few seconds later, the sedan can be seen doing the same thing. So again, this kind of gives timeline. Unfortunately, it it doesn't give them any more information on the cars where they exactly come from. You still can't see license plates or anything, you know, that they can use to identify anybody. So they have the body at the King County um medical examiners um, in Seattle, Mm -hmm. the autopsy is, is no help in identifying the victim either. There are no matches to her fingerprints in the system. Um, Dental records are, you know, usable, but it can take a very long time to get any kind of match on that. Um, So that's not an immediate help to them. Yeah. They start to think outside the box. They decide to try facial recognition software which is interesting. I think this is the first time that we've covered something where they tried to do that. Yeah. They so actually, have, yeah, we haven't tried that. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, it's a great tool. Uh, mm-hmm. it, I could see where it'd be very useful, but only if somebody is in some sort of system. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's not successful in this case. So the ME is able to determine that the cause of death was strangulation. But the victim also suffered from over 30 stab wounds okay, and then trauma to the head and neck. They know, you know, of course, that the victim had been set on fire after she was already deceased, which, like I said, only burned the clothing that she was wearing. But all in all, they're thinking whoever did this went to, you know, any and all lengths to destroy this woman. It also sounds like a crime of passion. You're yeah, stabbing say, somebody it that many times. Sounds very violent. Yeah. I wonder if it was, if it was multiple cars, was it multiple attackers? So they, I mean, at this point, they don't know. Mm-hmm. They just, they don't know. So then, the sheriffs get a break. Auburn Police Department contacts the detectives regarding an abandoned vehicle that was found in a neighborhood that was about two and a half miles from the crime scene. Mm-hmm. It's a dark sedan that they come to find out is registered to 64 year old Linda Sweezer. Her driver's license photo when they pulled that up is a positive ID to her as the murder victim. Okay. So Linda was a single woman who was living in the Kent area, which is about 20 minutes North of where her body was found in Lake taps. Yeah. Right. Where the car was found in Auburn is directly in between those two areas. 
So while the identity of Linda is being figured out, that's, you know, that's great. They um, also find her car, which is likely there's going to be some evidence there. Yeah. This is, you know, opens up more questions than what it actually answers, however. Yeah. yeah. So they, you know, some of the information on Linda, she was a pillar of her community. She was very active in outreach programs with her church. She also was um, very active with a organization called the Kent Black Action Commission. And she um, was very, just very present in her community. She really, you know, went to great lengths to try to preserve African-American culture, heritage, be present in the community. Also, you know, outreach, she would work at food banks. Yeah, She was just a very, just a very overwhelming, like love for her in yeah. the community because of all that she did. And she has no criminal history. She has no links to anything that could have ended with her being murdered. Yeah. They have no idea why she was taken essentially. Um, so the investigators are now asking questions, you know, number one, why was she murdered so brutally? That is not just a, a normal crime. Yeah. That is a horrific way to be stabbed so many times, blunt, you know, forced trauma, strangled and then set in on fire. Yeah. That's a lot. Um, number two, how did her car end up in Auburn, but her body in Lake Taps? Number three, how many suspects are really involved in this? Like how many people can, you know, they've got two cars. Yeah. How many people are in those cars? What, you know, literally it's a what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. So one good thing about knowing who the victim is, is investigators are going to be able to go and search her house. Yeah. Um, along with the car, they're going to search that, of course. They're going to get some evidence, hopefully. But before they even have a chance to organize what they need to do the search of the home, there's some information that comes to light that, n like, it came, nobody could have guessed this. Like, mm -hmm. this is another what the fuck. So Linda was in the middle of legally adopting her five-month-old granddaughter. Okay. And the child was currently living at Linda's home. The Department of Social and Human Services reached out to one of the lead detectives uh, with the sheriff's department with this info, who in turn then rushed over to Linda's home with backup, hoping that they would either find the baby was not there or that they would find it alive if it was. Yeah. Because the uh, Department of Social and Human Services knew that she was in custody of the baby. Mm hmm that baby's body had never had not been found with hers. There was no evidence of that baby yeah. anywhere up until this point. They had no information that there was a infant involved in any of this. So when they enter the home, it's very clear that this is where Linda was murdered. Um, they noticed blood in areas where there was obvious struggles um, of what had happened in the downstairs. They really aren't focused on that. Of course, they're trying to preserve the crime scene, but they're trying to see like, where's this child? So at this point, they get upstairs and in one of the uh, bedrooms, they find a very weak and lethargic baby. She was still alive, oh. thankfully. How long ago? I mean, um, like how long? So Linda was murdered the night of the 23rd of October. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, sometime around the 20, like evening of the 24th or the morning okay. of the 25th. So they couldn't get a, uh, I couldn't get a very good timeline on like when they got evidence yeah it was fairly quick though um i i know for sure when they actually arrest the suspect that there's you know the person that they have but mm -hmm. i don't like leading up to it is just kind of like and then they found out this and then they found out this okay and here's more information so it's i'm kind just wondering of, how long a five-year-old had been by themselves not a five-year-old honey five month old oh yeah, oh five month old baby infant Oh, I didn't think yeah. it was five. Okay. No, five month old. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah, the baby, at, at about 24 hours at least, if not close to 36. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. So they luckily were able to get there just in time. Like all of this played out just in time so that they could get that baby where it needed to be mm -hmm. so that they could get medical oh, care for it. Yeah. And the baby was able to recover and be fine. Okay. Yeah. Now they focus on processing the house. Yeah. So, and of course the vehicle. 
the home shows signs of struggle, but it's like I said, it's also clear that you know she was murdered there. But they're also noticing that on top of the struggle, there's actually signs of robbery. So somebody was trying to rob the house. Yeah. Her office is completely rummaged through and other areas of the house um, look to be like they were turned over. They suspect that Linda interrupted a robbery and confronted the person or persons and was murdered in the middle of it. They don't believe that the person or persons went up the stairs. So they don't believe that anybody after she was murdered, they did not go upstairs to search further. Basically just bounced. Right. So the scene has blood evidence, which they take samples of to process. They also find the knife that Linda was stabbed with um, that belonged in her kitchen. So the persons or person responsible did not bring this weapon. And, and then there's the car. So Linda's Nissan Sentra, which was found abandoned in Auburn in this like random neighborhood. It doesn't take much time for investigators to find a great deal of evidence. So there's remnants of garbage. There's cigarette butts. They take uh, swabs of blood and lift fingerprints from inside. And in the trunk, they find blood. So a lot of blood. And it's Linda's. They now know that she was murdered and taken from her home in the trunk of her car. Yeah. So there's still a lot left to piece together in this case. And we will get to all of that when we get back from this break. Auburn police are in contact with Pierce County Sheriff's investigators after finding Linda Sweezer's Nissan Sentra abandoned in a neighborhood the day after her murder. They pass along information that a woman just houses away from where the car was left had called in to the police uh, that her home had been broken into and her car was taken from her garage. This happened the morning of October 24th. So the same morning when Linda's body was found in Lake Taps. So just a, about two hours after. Okay. The woman states that she woke up when she heard noise coming from the downstairs front part of her house. So like somebody was rummaging through her shit. Yeah. It's just her and her daughter in the house. And she went in, checked on her daughter. Her daughter was still asleep. So she decides that she's going to, you know, look downstairs and see what's going on. It's obvious that somebody was in there and who shouldn't have been. She uh, is starts going downstairs just as she hears the garage door open and mm -hmm. her car being driven out of the garage. Okay. And this is around 5 a.m., she says. So then after that, she reports it. So she tells them the only thing that's missing is her daughter's backpack and their, like, key rings. Mm -hmm. So their car keys, their house keys, all of their, their keys. Yeah. Just this backpack. She doesn't ever get a look at who was in her home, um, but she tells police that her neighbor has a security camera that caught the person as they left. Oh. Yeah. So now investigators have more security footage to go through and they are able to see a man who kind of pops up in the neighborhood, starts walking along that street where the um, neighbor and the woman whose house was broken into. Yeah. It's about 4.34 a.m. It's an African-American man pacing back and forth in front of the neighbor's house. And obviously at 4.30 in the morning, what the fuck do you need to be in a neighborhood <laughs> that's not yours? Yeah. Um, he's tall. He's very slight, like, build. Mm -hmm. um, he has longer hair. It's past his shoulders about. Uh, and he's got, like, a beanie that he's wearing over it. And he's also wearing a neon, like, safety reflective vest. And it's very inconspicuous. Right. So there's, like, absolutely no reason for this guy to be out. They do, uh, eventually, investigators kind of piece together that he was probably, um, like, there was some construction along one of the main roads mm -hmm. uh, not far away from where this neighborhood is. Yeah. They think that maybe he had tried to put on this vest, gotten it somehow, put it on to yeah. try to look like he was one of those workers. Obviously not in the area of where the road work was actually happening though. Yeah. So it doesn't really make you blend at four o'clock in the morning. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but you know, obviously this guy is not that smart. Uh, so he's walking back and forth. He's pacing in front of uh, the house that has the security footage. Mm -hmm. And the house is directly on the corner. So you can kind of see him like come from across the street, 
uh, like he's pacing in front of their house and then he goes off camera towards the woman whose car he eventually steals. You see him go off camera. It's about 20 minutes that he uh, later is seen backing the car out of her garage and he stops the car. He puts it in park. He gets out. He actually goes and closes on the garage keypad, closes the garage door. Oh, how nice. Right. Gets back in the car, backs out, and you see him leaving the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. This is good footage. And it's it, it, again, helps with timeline. But it still does not give them a positive ID of yeah. who this person is. Or, or you know... Is he related at all to the murder Mm -hmm. of Linda? At this time, they don't have that connection. So after initially reaching out to the police in the, uh, or to the people in the neighborhood where Linda's car was abandoned, the Auburn police are able to also give the sheriffs a little bit of information and another security footage. This is surveillance um, in the form of a ring doorbell camera. Turns out the house where the car was abandoned has a ring doorbell Mm -hmm. and that footage shows a tall, very skinny African-American male with longer hair on their porch at 1.50 a.m. the morning of October 24th. Okay. He walks up. He's kind of on the porch area. You can see him kind of looking around, Mm -hmm. um, like scoping it out. He sees the ring doorbell. And he turns right back around and you can see him going to Linda's car. Mm -hmm. It's clearly the Nissan Sentra. Yeah. So now they have clear video of this guy. They can, you can see his face clear as day. Um, You can see that he's walking towards Linda's car. So he has possession of her vehicle Mm -hmm. and he also matches the description from the video footage. It would just be a couple hours later where he stole the car out of the garage. Okay. Definitely same person. So in hopes of getting more info, the police broaden a search in that neighborhood and they come across a witness who sees this guy. He can confirm that it's the same guy Uh in Linda's car in the middle of the night. Um, He's just kind of on the side of the road and he waves down this guy as he's trying to go home. And the witness says that the guy, you know, says, hey, can you give me a ride? And thankfully, this witness was like, yeah, no. I'm, you're not getting in my car, dude. Yeah. Like, sorry. Um, then the the guy says, "Well, can you get me gas?" And apparently, the car had stalled. Linda's car had mm-hmm. stalled. So he says, "Sure, I'll, I'll go get you some gas." This guy produces two gas cans, empty gas cans, what? out of his trunk. Not just one, two. Why would you need two? Yeah. Right. So two empty gas cans out of the truck. The witness then says, yeah, I'll go get you gas. Goes to a nearby place, fills them up, brings them back. The guy fills his car, or Linda's car. Yeah. And uh, it won't start still. So he's stuck. So then he says, hey, do you have a phone I can use to make a phone call? Hmm. And the guy says, yeah, here, you know, sure. I'm not going to give you a ride, but I'll let you use my phone. Yeah. He calls uh, two different people. Neither one picks up. So he hands back the the phone and the witness says like, sorry, good luck to you. But I, you know, I got to get home. Yeah. And he goes on his way. So the witness hands over his phone is able to provide those numbers to the authorities. And these phone numbers link to a woman and a man who are then later found out to be mother and son. With this info, they actually find that there is another son who has a criminal history of theft and burglary. Hmm. And when they look up his mugshot, it matches the ring doorbell footage. And they know that they, they have their guy. So this person is Lance Rougeau. And can I just add that he called his mom? <laughs> I'm sorry. That As just, one would. I'm like, you're, you've just committed murder. You've stolen somebody's car. Mm-hmm. Now that car stopped working and you're stuck in the middle of a neighborhood. You don't know anybody. And who do you call? You call your mommy. That's right. You call your mommy and you call your brother. That's right. I guess. I think I would have done it the other way around. I would call my brother before I call my mom. And he may have. I don't know in what order, but those are the two numbers that he called. Yeah. I'm maybe you're right. Maybe he called his brother first. And then when his brother didn't answer, he called his mom. 
So I'm if if she's anything like me, if you call me in the middle of the night, you better be dying. No. I like it better be serious. <laughs> I mean, your car breaking down and and not running and you're stuck in a neighborhood that's kind of serious, but I'd be irritated. I would be highly irritated. No. Yeah. But, you know, I'd still come get you. Yeah. <laughs> I would still come and get you. In this case though, you've com- you've done all of these horrible things and the car broke down and yeah, I'd be pissed. Well, yeah, I'm just yeah. that's who. I mean, like when the shit hits the fan, you always call your mom. I guess. I don't know. That would yeah. have been me. Like if I found no way out, I can just see that. Yeah. Oh, I fucked up. I, yeah, I mean, I. I may have broken in somewhere and then stabbed a woman. <laughs> Thirty times. Thirty times. And then strangled her. And now she's in the trunk. And yeah. And and I buried her. I need to go tried home. To burn her. <sighs> These kids, man. So Lance is quickly taken into custody at his mother's residence. So this is the twenty fifth of October. So they, I mean, they quickly get these pieces together with all this surveillance, you know, just mm. home home surveillance essentially, yeah. except for the uh, one at the business of the boating business yeah. in Lake Taps. It's all surveillance from somebody's house. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't, you know, he's questioned. They bring him in. He lives just blocks away from Linda's house. Mm -hmm. So obviously he's comfortable in that neighborhood trying to break in. Yeah. So they bring him in. He's not cooperative. He could give a fuck about what they're trying to ask him. Yeah. He, he's not answering shit. And they know that he was there. They Mm -hmm. know that he, you know, they've got his timeline. They've got, they don't have the evidence back that they've got his timeline. They know that he was there. They don't know at this point, is he the only one? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to ask him like, Hey, who else helped you? Like, were you doing this for somebody? Did you get caught? You got caught up in this. This is a mistake. Like what, what happened? Why did this happen? He's not talking. So, they hold him though. They have enough to hold him. Mm-hmm. And it takes about a month for the uh, DNA and the forensic evidence to be processed. When it comes back, there's confirmation that it's, uh, you know, Lance was involved in murdering Linda, which they already knew. The blood evidence uh, from her house is a match to him. Um, there's also evidence from the car that's a match. But another weird twist there's also DNA from an unknown female in Linda's car. There was not Linda. Huh. So investigators are like, huh, second accomplice. Yeah. We got this. They uh, are able to run the DNA and they get a match on a woman whose name is uh, Sharia. They're able to bring her in. She has a history. I don't know of what, but she does have a history. So she's obviously in the system. Yeah. They bring her in for questioning. However, quickly comes out. She's got no involvement in this case. So he had a very busy night that night. Turns out uh, she was in the car because they met up at a local casino Uh and he offered to give her a ride. Okay. Right. So not only did he come up murder, then he went to the casino. Then he went to dispose of the body. Yeah. Then he was hanging around the neighborhood in Auburn where the car stalled. And then somehow, you know, decides to steal a car so he can get home. It was a very busy night. He's a very busy man, yeah. Yeah. So she's in the car with him. Mm-hmm. She, I, I get the feeling that they knew each other maybe, like were acquaintances, because she was, she was trying to say, like, he was giving off a weird vibe. Yeah. And she was telling him, you know, whatever it is, you can tell me about it. Like, what's up? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. And she said that she just was getting this weird vibe. He wasn't talking. And so she decided to get on the phone and call another friend and have them meet up. And give her a ride home. Oh, okay. So this is the truck. Okay. Yeah. So the driver of the truck is her friend Lyle. Yeah. Who lives nearby to where the crime scene was, to yeah. where the uh, where the body was. Where the body was, yeah. They neither one of them have any involvement in this crime. Okay. She actually, uh, while they're talking to her, it dawns on everybody she was driving around in this car and he was at the casino with linda's body in the trunk had no idea so timeline being the crime at linda's house yeah she's in the trunk of the car he goes to the casino meets up with sharia Mm -hmm. 
Sharia gets the bad vibe. Uh, she says, hey, can you take me over to where my friend uh, Lyle lives? He'll come and get me from, you know, he'll just come over here and he'll come and pick me up. That's where the truck is. Truck leaves. He decides that he needs to dispose of the body. So this random area that he didn't plan on being is where he ends up trying to burn the body. Then he takes off in Auburn. He breaks down. Yeah. And then it plays out from there. Steals the other car. Goes home. So she has no idea that the entire time he's at this casino and she gets in the car with him. The, there's a body in the trunk. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's, you know, really her intuition probably saved her because yeah. who knows how much longer he would have allowed her to be in the car without doing something stupid uh, or, or panicking and killing her too. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, there's there's no way of telling if if she was in danger or not. Well, maybe because he was all quiet and weird. Right, and she kept pressing him. Yeah, and she kept, you know, hey, you could tell me what's going on. So I I do think he probably would have panicked at some point. And you know, if he was already acting sketchy, chances are he he would have broke. Maybe you know, I don't know. He's on his way to a casino. I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a weird, it, it's, it's weird. Uh, maybe he had an impulse to go to the casino. Once he got there, he would have been fine. But then coming home, you know, driving her to right. meet the friend. That's probably when he would have done it. That's what I, I mean, that's kind of, yeah. I'm just I assuming, but. I, I'm just, I, to me, I think she's lucky that she was able to get out of the situation. Yeah. Cause I, I do feel at some point he might have snapped yeah yeah i and so i you know ladies this is what i say ladies always trust your intuition it's yes. years it's generations and generations of of human evolution when the hairs on the back of your neck or something just feels off go with it get yeah. out of that situation it's built into us don't ignore it no i mean even even if you think even if you know the the people or your surroundings and you at one point have been comfortable there mm -hmm. or with those people the second you get a bad vibe mm -hmm. there's a reason oh, there's yeah. always a reason and that's just it is one of those things where especially as women we have to think along those lines unfortunately yeah and well, you have to be especially prepared. in these situations, you know what I mean? Like she knew something was off. Right. And just, yeah, just go with your gut. Yeah. Get the fuck out. Do yeah. what you got to do. You can say sorry later if you're wrong. Yeah. You know, if, if it's a, if there's a, something else that is the outcome of that, but you can't apologize if you're harmed or, or dead. No. You know, and I don't want to scare anybody, but I always try to think like that. Like mm -hmm. if I was in a situation, what would I need to do? Yeah. 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 Trust your gut, man. So now investigators know there's only one person responsible for the murder of Linda Sweezer and formal charges are brought against him for the first degree murder and vehicle theft um, twice. Mm -hmm. So they claim that Linda interrupted Lance the night of the 23rd. He attempted to break in. He was going to rob her home. Yeah. Probably, you know, fearing for the worst for her granddaughter upstairs. Linda tried to like threaten Lance and get him to leave the house. Yeah. Um, but then things turned very violent. And that is why I say that this woman, uh, Sharia was lucky to get away from him when she probably, when she did probably because just like in this case, you would think this was a crime of passion. Yeah. Stabbing no, somebody yeah, that, many times that many times is, you know, especially if you're just entering and your intent is to rob somebody yeah. and they interrupt you on that. The fact that you not just, you know, tried to kill her one way, you tried to kill her four different ways. Yeah. Well, three, but then you then you took it a step further and you needed to dispose of the body. Yeah. So your idea was to go burn it somewhere. This is a very violent man. Oh, yeah. So obviously she I was not say, able. Uh, yeah, violent, but also unpredictable. Right. Yes. You strangled her, but then you stabbed her 30 times. Or I don't know if the coroner had determined. So the, the stabbing and the blunt force trauma did not kill her. The strangulation killed her. 
So he probably, yeah. So he started he, with he blood her, forced stabbing and then strangled her. Yeah, found out that she wasn't all the way dead. Right. And then strangled her. Right. Wow. So, I mean, to to do that, like you said, yeah, exactly what you said. It's unpredictable. Yeah. So he may have never intended to harm this woman in the car no. with him. But you can't predict what this crazy person's doing. No. Like she, yeah, there was a reason why her, her gut was telling her, get the fuck out of there. Yeah. So, of course, Linda, you know, was not able to fight him off. And, and there's just no explanation of why he did what he did other than he was just intending to rob her. There is never, he never gives an explanation of, of why it was so violent. Yeah. So Lance Rougeau was arraigned on October 30th. So 2017 bail was set for a million dollars. Um, the trial was set to start. There was of course some appeals. He pled uh, not guilty mm -hmm. to all of the charges um, his defense team tried to play into the fact that the police had originally suspected that there was more than one uh, accomplice mm -hmm. to this crime. But I mean, every piece of evidence they had only linked to him. Yeah, it's just it's yeah. it's a defense team. Remember, you have right. to be on a reasonable doubt. And if they could throw any doubt in there. Right. That's just their job. Exactly. So also on the 30th, there was a candlelight vigil that was held for Linda. Uh -huh. um, members of the Kent community, her family, um, her friends gathered to remember, you know, the, this wonderful woman who had touched so many lives. And everybody was just so shocked at how senseless this was. So her sister and some family members, she's originally from Michigan, from yeah. uh, Flint, Michigan. Uh -huh. So she had family member that because of quarantine could not make it to like the trial. Yeah. Um, but you know, all of these people just turned out in so many numbers to, to come to this vigil for mm -hmm. her. Um, so the trial starts February of 2020. It within four months, he's found guilty by jury. Uh, you know, it was, Absolutely no doubt the so jury February or October February of 2020. So he was arraigned in 2017. Okay. Yeah. So four months, the jury had no problem convicting him. He was sentenced to serve 45 years and eight months for first degree murder and then vehicle theft. He is currently in, um, and I've never heard of this Kalama, Bay Correction Center mm -hmm. in Kalama County, Washington. Mm -hmm. Apparently that is another place where violent offenders can go. So not just Walla Walla. No. I, I thought that was the only one in the state. So as a way to remember and honor Linda, the Kent Black Action uh, Commission renamed their annual Juneteenth celebration in Linda's name. So, you know, this was a big part of of her life, mm -hmm. she really made an impact yeah. in, in the community and, and this celebration that they held annually. So they wanted to do something, you know, to, to remember that and honor that. Um, I was able to find out that they are holding the celebration this year. Mm -hmm. So it was not held last year, of course, because of 2020 yeah. um, and COVID. But it will be held this Saturday. So when you're listening to this tomorrow at Merrill Meadows Park in Kent, there is a food event from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then the actual event starts at 3 p.m. So given this past year and the cultural climate, I think it's incredibly important to support this event. And I encourage everybody to just kind of educate yourselves on what Juneteenth is. I won't go into it, but um, information is out there. And I think it's important to know it's relevant I also encourage everybody to find a local event near you and go join in. Um, if you're in the Kent area, go celebrate the 10th annual Juneteenth event in Linda's honor. And, you know, I think it's just, it's a great way to get into your community and support your community and, and know about the people that, you know, you live and work with and are around. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think it's really special that, you know, this is something that she was passionate about and they chose this way to honor her, to yeah. remember her. 
And, you know, it's her legacy. So I think it's really um, just a really cool way to to do that, to honor her. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really a shame that, you know, these for whatever reason, this dumbass decided to break into her house and rob her. And this is what ended, you know, ended up happening. Yeah. You know, when a wonderful person was taken from the community. So yeah, yeah it sucks. It is. So that's all I got for you. It's kind of heavy. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. Um, please let us know your thoughts on this case. And if you can, we love to hear from you guys. Rate us and review us. Um, that's We always want feedback. We want to hear from you guys. Any Anything to add? No. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you for listening. Um, so happy Pride Month. Happy Juneteenth. Happy summer solstice. Happy birthday, Mara and Colin. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also happy Father's Day, Bryce, and oh, all the dads thanks. out there. Yes. Yeah. All right. Until we meet again for some true crime, be kind to one another, please. You never know what people are going through. We're all in this together. And as always, thank you for listening. We will see you next time. And of course, Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. Bye, guys. Hi. Roscoe, was that a good take?